Shall we turn to the final chapter of Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter 12? The writers ranged over the whole uh, gamut of human experience in the previous 11 chapters. He's talked about how meaningless much of life is. And in chapter 12, he reaches his conclusion. And I want to read verses 13 and 14. Now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. I guess we all slightly dread growing old. The greying hair, the aching limbs, the expanding waistline, the fading eyesight, the deteriorating memory and hearing. Well, one could go on. We all know what it's like. The trouble is that at a certain stage in life, we don't think it's going to happen to us. Uh, you may know Pink Floyd's classic album, The Dark Side of the Moon. You may know the song Time that comes in it. Here are some of the words. Every year is getting shorter. Never seem to find the time. Plans that either come to naught or half a page of scribbled lines. Hanging on in quiet desperation is the English way. The time is gone. The song is over. Thought I'd something more to say. I remember listening to that song, singing it over and over again, but I never thought it would be me. Well, when we come to the final chapter of Ecclesiastes, he begins to tackle old age and what it means to get old, and in the light of that, how we should live our lives. He has been wrestling in the early 11 chapters with the enigmas of life, seeing how much of it is utterly pointless. We can make potloads of money, but we can have to leave it in the end or behind. We can live life as honorably as we can, and yet those who break the rules seem to get all the breaks. We can achieve all we want to achieve, but when we've made it, we wonder what it's all for. And yet at the same time, there's been running through the book a sort of golden thread. Life may seem pointless, but that is life under the sun. That is life without God. And life with God is somehow different. Well, here in chapter 12, we come to the conclusion. Now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. It's not the conclusion to the Bible's teaching on life. That only comes in the New Testament with the coming and teaching of Jesus. But nevertheless, it points us in that direction. It gives us clear principles that are just as vital now as when they were written. So what is this conclusion? What is the king's advice? Well, having seen the world, having tasted all the forbidden fruits, having tried everything, what does the writer say? Well, there are four questions that I want us to look at. What, when, how, and why? First then, what? What is the advice? Verse 13, fear God, keep his commandments. And verse 1, remember your creator in the days of your youth. We live in the world that is always looking for answers. Knows things are not as they should be, but cannot work out what the answer actually is. We want to educate our youngsters to make them better. We want people to recognise that there are more important things than money or possessions, but we don't know how. Well, the writer says here, the answer all the time is staring you in the face. Remember your Creator. Fear God. Keep His commandments. Put God in His rightful place, and everything else will fit together. And that is the one thing our society finds so hard to do. It's often been said that the demise of a society begins when it ceases to fear God. And our society has ceased to fear God. Instead, it has come to praise atheism and life without God. You've probably heard about the atheistic summer camp set up by Richard Dawkins and his friends. Well, the, the, the Times described one of these camps recently in this way. Camp girls are given a test called the Invisible Unicorn Challenge. Children are told by camp leaders that the area around their tents is inhabited by two unicorns. The activities of these creatures, of which there will be no physical evidence, will be regularly discussed by organisers, yet the children will be asked to prove the unicorns do not exist. Anyone who manages to prove this will win a £10 note, which features an image of Charles Darwin and will be signed by Dawkins himself. Well, I don't know if any of the children managed to win the note, but you ask yourself, what's it all for? Why do you have a camp just to tell people what not to believe. What are they so frightened of? 
It seems so pathetically empty and so hopeless, doesn't it? And I wonder if at the heart of it all, the reason they shout so loudly is they know what the writer of Ecclesiastes says is right, that life without God is meaningless. So what is the command he gives at the end of this book? Remember your Creator. Fear God. Second question, when? When are we to do this? Remember your Creator, verse 1, in the days of your youth, before the days of trouble come, and the years approach when you will say, I find no pleasure in them. Before old age, before death, when life ceases to be fun, when you will say, I find no pleasure in them. And as he goes through these next verses, the writer lists some of the signs of getting older. And it's a very poignant picture. In verse 3, when the grinders cease because they're few. I suppose that means when we lose our teeth. When those looking through the window grow dim. Our eyes grow dim. Our eyesight fails. As we grow older, we become less active. When the doors to the street are closed and the sound of grinding fades, we find sleep harder. We wake early in the morning when men rise at the sound of birds. But the irony is that whilst they wake early for the dawn chorus, they can't actually hear it because their hearing is gone, so all their songs are faint. We get more frightened of things that we've never been frightened of before. Men are afraid of heights and dangers in the streets. We become grey. The almond tree blossoms. Our bodies no longer respond in the way they used to. The grasshopper drags himself along. Our libido declines. Desire is no longer stirred. Do you recognise the signs? I guess we all do. It's me. That's you. Or at least it will be one day. And then the inevitable fate. Death itself. In some ways it's a, it's a sad list. But it's not really there to depress us. It's there to shake us up. It's there to make us see a vital reality. That it's far better to remember our Creator when we are young. To fear Him and to keep His commandments when we are young. Not to leave it until old age. It's often thought, isn't it, that church is really just for old people. And the older you get, the more likely you are to come to church. You look around many churches and that is the impression that you may get. And yet all the statistics show us something else. They show that the people who follow Christ have almost invariably made up their minds to follow Him when they were young. And if we do not remember Him in the days of our youth, the chances are we never will. Remember your Creator in the days of your youth. So don't put things off because the chance may never come again. What? Remember your Creator. When? In the days of your youth. Thirdly, how? We see that in verses uh, 10 and 11. The teacher searched to find just the right words and what he write, wrote was upright and true. The, wi the words of the wise are like goads. They're collected sayings like firmly embedded nails given by one shepherd. And so, verse 12, be warned, my son, of anything in addition to them. How are we to remember our Creator? We'll answer by our attitude to His words, the words given by one shepherd, the words we have here in this book. That's the way to remember Him, by what He says. Notice that we're to remember our Creator and remember his words in these ways. First of all, we're to acknowledge their truth. The teacher searched to find just the right words, and what he wrote was upright and true. You see, these words are not just the words of any old teacher. They are right and true. They are the words of God himself. And it is a wise person who takes the words of this book seriously and recognizes that here is truth. We're to acknowledge their truth. Second, we're to accept their correction. Verse 11. The words of the wise are like goads. They're collected sayings like firmly embedded nails. Goads are sharp pointed sticks used by shepherds to guide and point sheep in the right direction. And the function of scripture, or one of its functions, is to prod us, to direct us. We must allow it to correct us. See, when we read a passage of scripture, we must ask ourselves, what in my life needs to change as a result of what I've read? Because if we're to fear God, that's what we must do. Thirdly, we're to admit their supremacy in verse 12. Be warned, my son, of anything in addition to them. 
of making many books there is no end. Much study is a weariness of the flesh. Do you notice that little touch? Be warned of anything in addition to them. So the Mormons will add to the Bible the Book of Mormon. The Jehovah's Witnesses will add the Watchtower. The Moonies will add the Divine Principle. They all add something else. And the writer here says, be warned of anything in addition to these words. We don't need anything else. What we have here is sufficient. So how are we to fear God and to remember him? Through his words. And then finally, why? Why is this so important? Verse 13 and 14, all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. Here is the very climax of the book, the point at which all has been leading. What is the point of life? With so much around us seeming totally meaningless, we must fear God and keep his commandments. But why does it matter so much? And so the writer ends with two reasons we never lose sight of. Two reasons for going God's way. One, it is why we were made. This is the whole duty of man. As yet the heart of the agonizing in Ecclesiastes lies this question, what are we for? What is the point of our lives? Money, success, work, relationships? That's what the world might say. Well, here lies the answer. Our duty is to fear and follow God, to keep his commands. That is why we were made. Why should we fear him? It's what we were made for. And if we do what we were made for, we won't go far wrong. But there's another reason. And we see that in verse 14. Not just why we were made, it's where we're going. God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. We will all one day face a judgment. And judgment brings everything into proper perspective. There is the prospect that one day every wrong will be righted, every injustice sorted. And it's the one thing that makes sense of life. You see, the world may seem pointless or meaningless to many people. Why do bad things happen to good people and good things happen to bad people? Why is so much of life seemingly wasted? Well, the answer is simple. One day, we will all stand before God and give an account for everything, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. Everything we do, therefore, every day has significance. The words we speak to our husbands, our wives, our children, our parents, our grandchildren, our work colleagues, they will all be brought into account. It may seem pointless, but it isn't, because it matters to God. So remember your Creator. Fear God. Keep His commands. Why? Because one day we will be accounted for it. And maybe the question we left with is this. What would you do today if you knew that you were going to meet with God tomorrow? What would I do? Well, the writer says, do it now. Because every day counts, every action counts.